we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities Mars was inhabited? And these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you, along with Timothy Renner. Timothy, of course, is an illustrator, author, researcher. His illustrations have appeared on the pages of various books, magazines, comics, as well as on many record and CD covers. Since 1995, Timothy is the creator of Strange Familiars, a podcast concerning the paranormal, the weird, folklore, and the occult. And, of course, a noted author as well. Timothy, welcome back to the program. It's great to be back, George. So how is the Bigfoot collection coming along? Oh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's never-ending. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I started with Pennsylvania, and I've moved on to the West Coast, and I'm going to go ahead and try to do the whole country as time allows. Do these reports come to you, or do you have to go find them? How do they, uh, how do they come? I spend a lot of time researching, um, a lot of microfilm research, a lot of uh, newspaper archive research. Tim, what have you concluded about this creature or whatever it might be? Um, <laughs> it's very strange. I don't think it's a natural animal. I don't, I don't think it's a natural gorilla. Um, but that said, I don't know what it is. And I, I do believe it's something real. It's something that leaves footprints and hair behind. But uh, it's very strange. Um, we can't seem to get a really good, clear picture of it. They don't show up on trail cams. They, they seem to know what trail cams are. Um, it, it's just a very, very strange thing that, uh, so it, my answer is, it's, I say it's unsexy. My very unsexy answer yeah. is, uh, I don't know, but I'm, I'm completely fascinated and it's not going to stop me from looking into them. You have not ruled out uh, dimensional or extraterrestrial either, have you? I don't think we can at this point. Um, we just, we just don't know enough and there's so much strangeness that surrounds these creatures, um. I mean, we can't say they're being dropped off in UFOs, but we can say certainly whatever conditions that seem favorable for Bigfoot also seem favorable for mystery lights because these mystery lights are seen in the same places around the same time very often. What got you involved in this, Timothy? Well, uh, my first book, I turned up, it was, that was more of a, a local thing, Beyond the Seventh Gate, my first book, and I turned up a lot of Bigfoot reports locally, more than I ever thought I would. So I started, that got me interested. I thought, well, I'm going to dig in and see what I can find for the whole state of Pennsylvania. And I found so many for the whole state that I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, I'll see what I can find for other areas. So I've, uh, I'm really, really fascinated in it because it seems whatever they're describing, that the behavior is, uh, that's the most exciting thing for me because it seems that modern witnesses are describing the same behaviors that they were describing in the 1800s. Now, the, the 1800 reports, they didn't call them Bigfoot or Sasquatch. What did they call these creatures? Most often it was wild men. That's what you'll find most often until the late 1800s, right around 1890, the turn of the century, 1900. They start calling them gorillas. You see a, a definite shift in the article from before they were called wild men, they start calling them gorillas. The reason for this is the discovery of the mountain gorilla. And most people didn't know what a gorilla was until the late 1800s. Then they start seeing them in pictures, and they start hearing stories of, of mountain gorillas and so forth. So now they have 
uh, a name to put to something that's upright and covered in hair and walks like a man but isn't a man. So they call it a gorilla at that point. But before then, they'll call it a wild man. Anything, that's the most common name. Sometimes you get hairy giants or monkey man or something like that, but the, the most uh, frequently used name is wild man. Well, and that tells me that most of the sightings, uh, they thought that uh, they could have been some kind of out-of-control human being. Uh, you know, when you say wild man, you haven't attached an animal name to it at all. So they they probably thought it was human. I think it was a matter of just having a, a name to put on something. They saw something that walked upright like a man that was covered in hair. And, you know, this is right around the time of, of Darwin. And there's a lot of confusion in the articles. There's a lot of ideas in these old articles that if someone walks away from society, they will turn wild and grow hair all over their body. It's, it's a very strange kind of misinterpretation of the, the idea of Darwinism, I, I believe. But they didn't call this wild bear or anything like that. No, no. It's, it's most often it's wild man. But, you know, when they're describing one that's, you know, seven foot tall and its arms, you know, reach down below his knees and it's covered in hair all over, you can kind of pretty much say, well, it probably wasn't a person. <laughs> Were some of the reports so startling for you as you came across them that, uh, you know, you thought, you know, maybe there's something to this, and two, these might not be friendly creatures? Yeah, these, um, and I I believe this applies today, too. These creatures will eat your pets. I mean, they eat pets on the regular, I believe, and occasionally I think they they take humans, and I don't know whether it's uh, you just get a, a, a bad one, you know, in the mix, like like a bad person here and there, um, or what the actual reason is. But I believe to this day, every now and then, uh, some of these missing people might be attributed to these creatures. Can you cite uh, one of the older stories from the past and uh, kind of give, give us a, a little uh, glimpse into what it was like? Sure, sure. Um, let's see. My favorite story is... Uh, it's a gorilla account. Now, these come from, this comes from Pennsylvania. It's the Altoona Tribune, 1920. And this is, there was a whole uh, series of, of gorilla sightings. Now, they're seeing gorillas in the winter. This is December. These sightings go throughout the winter of 1920 and into the summer. You can tr- basically trace this creature or creatures. It might have been more than one as they make their way across the state. It's very interesting. But this is the account of Samuel Bullock. Um, so it's, it, I'll read a little excerpt. All right. And he was the witness? Yes. Okay. Yes. Samuel and Margaret Bullock, the children of Charles Bullock, were gathering kindling wood one night in November with the light of a search lamp when a huge animal, about seven feet tall, and that stood up like a man, was discovered by the children within the circle of light. It looked to them like a huge monkey, and when discovered, dropped on all fours and ambled away, soon disappearing in the darkness. A week later, the same animal was discovered in a cornfield on the Bullock farm, which is at the foot of the mountain. Samuel procured a 32 caliber rifle and took a shot at the huge man creature, evidently wounding it as it fell at the shot, rolling over several times on the ground. The boy and his father trailed the wounded ape some distance by the blood, but were unable to overtake it, and at length gave up pursuit. On Monday night of the present week, the strange creature made its third appearance on the Bullock farm. Charles Bullock was engaged in chopping wood by the light of a lantern, when the ape approached near enough to be seen. The son ran to the house and procured a rifle, but before he could shoot the gorilla, it viciously attacked him, knocking him down and breaking his arm, and was finally driven away by the father. The lad lay on the ground in an unconscious condition. He was taken to the house and soon recovered his senses, and it was found that he was not seriously injured. He suffered much from shock, but is expected to be fully recovered in a short time. So that's Hmm. one of these uh, accounts that demonstrates so much of the behavior that we see in these creatures uh, in modern reports, a lot of people who take shots at them, they will follow them back home and they will wait until they have an opportunity. And that's when a lot of these attacks occur. Clearly, there's something to this, Timothy. I believe there is. Yeah. Like I said, it, it's the descriptions of the creatures and the descriptions of the behavior that that are the same throughout time. Now, there are a lot of reports of Northwest Bigfoot sightings, of course, and uh, you, of course, highlighted one of your books called Bigfoot in Pennsylvania. Were there many stories there? Yeah, I found more in Pennsylvania, which was really surprising, than in uh, the West Coast. I thought, you know, going into it, sure, surely I'll find more in 
you, you know, would, you would think, Washington yeah. State and, and so forth. But I found uh, quite a few more in Pennsylvania. Why do you think that's the case? I think it comes down to population and the amount of newspapers. We had a larger population in Pennsylvania in the 1800s to see the creatures, and we had a lot more newspapers. This is, you know, Ben Franklin started one of the first newspapers in the country here, and the first printing press in the country was in Pennsylvania. So we have a very strong history of newspapers here. So I believe it just comes down to that. Tim, uh, the name of your website, darkhollerarts.com, correct? Yes. Super. And we've got that linked up at coasttocoastam.com. We're going to come back in just a moment with Timothy Renner and talk more about his work trying to look for Bigfoot. We're going to talk about the possibility of home invasions, missing people. As a matter of fact, I've got to tell you, there are at any given time 90,000 people missing in the United States, just simply missing. They cannot find them. Are some of them taken by Bigfoot? We'll find out. Timothy Renner, our special guest on Coast to Coast AM. Timothy, at any given time, there are 90,000 people missing in the United States, simply missing. Now, we have a guest that comes on, David Politis, who has written extensive books and research on these missing people. But in his particular case, he's more concerned about uh, strange disappearances where they're in... uh, Federal parks, for example, and, uh, you know, parents will turn around and their child is gone, just missing, with no sound. You know, if it was an animal that came sweeping down from the hills to grab the kid, you'd, you'd hear the, the animal making noise and the kid screaming. There's nothing like that. But in this case, 90,000 Americans are missing on any given year. Who's to say that these Bigfoot creatures aren't grabbing people? Well, yeah, um I think there's evidence uh, here and there that, that they could have been uh, or and could still be. I have uh, I collected one report. I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, David Pilates' work. Um, I, I have uh, quite a selection of his books. Okay. He's a great and researcher. Have, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very much respect uh, Mr. Pilates. And I found one report from 1888 that reads like it could have come out of one of David's books. And... Uh, this is the case of Florence Hughes, and she was a two-year-old girl. She was being watched by her uh, siblings, two other siblings. They turned their back to gather some flowers, and she disappeared. Jeez. Now, they said all day long a fruitless search was kept up. It was a searching party of over 100 people that started almost right away. So every nook and spot in the, in the fields within a radius of one mile was examined closely. So very quickly after they realized she was missing, they had 100 people searching. Later that night, they had 200 men out with uh, torches and lanterns, scouring the woods all evening. And the one note in this article, it is said that people were worried because it is thought that she may have been carried away by the wild man who was seen by several in this locality recently. And then just like in the reports David collects, as the night goes on, a heavy fog rolls in and they have to abandon the search. That's scary stuff, Tim, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a disturbing amount of reports that I, I have another sort of almost abduction where a a female creature picked up a little girl and started running away with her. And they uh, people chased her down and she, she dropped the child before she got away. Jeez. Now, is, it, have, is the child screaming at all? Yeah, the, that article notes that the child, the mother saw, the, saw her pick her up. The child, the mother, and the creature, I think, were all screaming. They, they make note and, and uh, eventually dropped the child, though, before it made off with it. Uh, there's other other instances where the creatures will beckon to children. They'll, they'll come. Uh, I have one in the West Coast book. It throws a stone first, which is another noted Bigfoot behavior to get the kid's attention. The kid looks up and, and uh, said the creature was beckoning to him. Uh, that child, the mother saw, I believe, and, and ran out and, and got the kid in the house. Do we think the creature does harm to the child or the individual they pick up, or are they just keeping them? It's hard to say. I, I have a good friend who's a researcher, and he thinks that it's some sort of breeding program. I, I, you know, I don't know. That sounds outrageous that's, to me. Yeah, that's but, a little far-fetched, isn't it? Yeah, the whole, the whole thing seems, you know, a little outrageous, I guess. We're talking about eight-foot-tall, you know, hairy creatures that run around in the woods. But um, to me, I think it's probably more curiosity uh, that we look like them. You know, we, we walk on two legs, as they do. 
they see us and and maybe uh maybe it's it's something like that they're just they're just grabbing it out of curiosity and and uh then uh unfortunately i i think uh a lot of uh people end up dying after they get taken there was a report once of a family of bigfoot throwing rocks against the side of a house and the lady came out and she you know basically chased them away um have there been reports that these creatures have broken into homes directly? Yes, I, I've collected one from the. This is from the Oakland Tribune from 1920, and it says burglar looks like a huge ape. So it's the shaggy orangutan in Poe's Murders in the Room Morgue could have been no more horrifying in appearance than the man or beast who, at three o'clock on a recent morning, invaded the bedroom of two small girls in Long Beach. The tiny daughters of H.H. H. Thompson were asleep in their room when they were awakened by a man in the room. They screamed and huddled under the bedclothes in fear. The father heard the screams and rushed into the room just in time to see the most gorilla-like man he'd ever seen climbing out of the window. Before the girl's father could reach the window, the man had dropped to the ground and escaped. Thompson, now this is the father, Thompson says the man's head and face were so covered with long black shaggy hair that along with his immense size and ferocious stoop, he in every way resembled a large ape. So that's to me. That's not the the little girls calling him an ape. That you know, that's the father who came right. to the room who described him. Jeez. And are they? Do they damage the house, or do they seem to know what they're doing? In most cases, they they don't come in, and this applies to modern reports and old reports. They'll jiggle handles. They'll they'll knock on windows. And again, it's one of the very strange things to do with these creatures because certainly they're immense enough where they could, you know, basically bust through any door. They could tear off any door they wanted to, but the, they seem to somehow not come in structures for for some reason. Uh, now, this in this case, they don't note whether the window was open already. Uh, you know, the, there's no information as to as to what state the window was in. So I don't know whether the creature encountered an open window and thought, well, I'm just I'm coming in, you know, or or what. We're with Timothy Renner. Timothy, uh, 1888, Dead Man's Hole in California. Tell me more. Oh, that's a scary one. Now, this, I think, points to uh, at least this creature was eating people. Eating people? That's what it seems like. Oh, God. What happened? So this is Dead Man's Hole. It's an isolated hollow in northern San Diego County. It was a stagecoach stop at the time in 1888. So I looked into this. After I found the story, I just looked into... Dead Man's Hole in 1888, and at least seven human corpses were found in the area. Many were brutally strangled and beaten when they found them. So this article notes two hunters who go into this hollow, and they said it was unusual to go in there because they, there wasn't game in general in there, but they, for some reason they decided to explore this hollow. The article notes an eerie silence before they encounter the creature. This is, again, something that's reported today. People report, oh, the, the woods went dead quiet right before I saw them. And then they describe the creature. I'll, I'll read their description. It's very, very intense description, including the soles of the feet, which sound like, again, what they would are describe. People that get to see him today describe a pad-like foot on the bottom, almost like a dog. And they describe, and they describe the locomotion where the creatures. You can see the bottom of the creature's feet as it walks, which is very much like the Patterson Gimlin film. So as they they follow this and they see something, these two hunters, and I'll pick up with the article there. Sure. An immense, unwieldy animal that from a rear view resembled a bear was making rapid strides through the narrow dell. Its legs were long, and they were used with such ease and facility in climbing over the rocks that on second thought, the animal appeared more like an immense gorilla. Its hair was dark brown, and it was at least six feet in height. The front legs from their use resembled arms, and the beast moved uprightly like a man or a monkey. Its body was quite round and covered with extremely long hair, much like that of, unlike that of any hair of any animal. The hind legs or feet from the knees down were the most peculiar features about the strange being. They were extremely broad and long. The insides of them upon which the animal walked were entirely bare of hair. Every time it made a move, it exposed the view of the bottom of its immense paws. Except for the hair, the arms and hands of the beast greatly resembled those of a human being. The body was large and round and entirely devoid of a tail. So they track this creature through this, this hollow, and they end up shooting it. It's climbing up into a cave and one of the hunters takes a shot at it and drops the creature. It lands on a boulder, and they go up, and then they describe in in great detail. So the face was exposed to view as it lay on its side on the rock. The features were unmistakably Indian in character. The hair on the face were few and black. On the head, it was long and jet black, like that of an Indian. 
The skin of the face was very dark and wrinkled. The teeth, which were partly exposed by the position of the mouth, were plainly those of a carnivorous animal. They were longer than those of a human being. Perhaps the most singular point about the strange creature was the disproportion between its head and body. The former was not larger than that of an ordinary, ordinary man, and yet the body would weigh 400 pounds. The long muscular arms were provided with a pair of hands almost exactly like those of a man. There were five fingers on each hand. The outside of the fingers were covered with hair, but on the inside the skin was bare and white and thickly calloused. The feet, if such they could be called, were unlike anything the hunters had seen. They were two feet long, eight inches broad, and covered on the bottom with a hard substance like that of a dog. So they, after they look at this creature, they proceed to the cave that it was headed towards, and they cautiously enter. They said they were, they were afraid of uh, running into its mate. But in the corner of the cave was a pile of bones, among which were portions of human skeletons. There's no doubt that if the bodies of Blair and Belida, those were the two of the people that had been found dead there, had not been found on the day they were murdered, they would never again have been heard of, as was the case with the many other mysterious disappearances in Dead Man's Hole. Are you still getting reports, active reports from that area? I've looked it up. I, I haven't found any uh, recently, but uh, th- that one was, was so intense. That's a bizarre I, one. Yeah, yeah I don't, and I don't know if this is one rogue creature or if there were, there were more working there, but that, it does seem to point to uh, something that was killing people that, that meets the description of a, of a Bigfoot. Are all the old articles on the Internet now, or do you still physically have to go find them? Most of them are are uh, in different newspaper ar- archives. If you take the time, you can find some on the internet. But I try to go and hit old historical societies where they have not every newspaper is online. microfilm, right? Yeah, I have a lot of microfilm searching. I spend a lot of time in libraries and historical societies. What has been for you one of the strangest Bigfoot stories that you stumbled across? It's one in the in the West Coast Wild Men book. It's very very strange. It's from 1857 in Oregon. They're all old cases, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And this one starts out like a, a somewhat uh, typical uh, maybe abduction story and then takes a hard left turn into something very, very strange. So basically uh, a boy and an older gentleman are out looking for some lost cattle. And this is towards midnight. The boy was awakened by a loud plane of cry that appeared to emanate from a human being in distress, not far distance from the spot where he reclined. He goes out searching for the object, and he sees an object approaching him that appeared like a man, about 12 or 15 feet high, of athletic proportions, with glaring eyes which had the appearance of liquid balls of fire. The monster drew near the boy, who was unable from fright to move a single step, and seizing him by the arm, dragged him forcibly away towards the mountains. And he dragged him for over uh, an hour. This is the estimation of of, uh, the boy. And he sits down and says, Our hero then became aware that the creature was indeed a wild man, whose body was completely covered with shaggy brown hair, about four inches in length. Some of his teeth protruded from his mouth like tusks. His hands were armed with formidable claws instead of fingers. But his feet, singular to relate, appeared natural. Uh, The creature picks him up again. He moves into a... The the article is very long. We wouldn't have time to read the whole thing. But he moves him into a, a... a brush, an area of thick brush, and howls and opens up a cave in the ground. This is where the report gets very, very huh. strange. He, they climb down into the cave, which was brilliantly illuminated with a peculiar phosphorescent light. Above the cave seemed slightly arched, the ceiling apparently composed of seashells of every conceivable shape and color. The bottom was, or appeared to be, thickly strewn with the bones of many kinds of animals. The creature then leaves, comes back, leading by the hand, a young and delicate female of most miraculous grace and beauty, who had doubtless been immured in this dreadful dungeon for years. As they approached our hero, the young lady fell upon her knees, and in some unknown language, in plaintive accents, seemed to plead for the privilege of remaining forever in the cave of the wild man. This singular conduct caused our hero to imagine that the wild man, conscious stricken had resolved to set at liberty his lovely victim by placing her in charge of our hero, whom he had evidently captured for that purpose. As this thought passed through the mind of our hero, his ears were greeted with the strains of the most unearthly music which came from the innermost recesses of the cave. The wild man wept piteously as he listened to the sweet voice of the charmer, commingled with the wild music. Sobbing like a child, his handkerchief moist with grief, he raised her very carefully from her recumbent posture and led her gently away as they had come. 
A moment afterwards, the damsel returned alone, advancing towards our hero with ladylike modesty and grace, and placed in his hands a beautifully embossed card, upon which the following words were traced in the most exquisite hand, evidently the lady's own. And it said, Boy, depart henceforth with, or remain and be de- devoured. So it's a very strange case where it, it you know, sounds like a, a Bigfoot abduction case, and then it, it makes this hard left turn into the, the strange cave. and, and Bizarre. The whole thing's yeah. strange. Yeah, I mean, very, very strange. Almost like an emotional Bigfoot. Yes, yes, and it, the the kidnapping and the strange cave it, it has elements of like Irish fairy stories. Well, well, and what was the music all about? Yeah, I have, I, yeah, that's just a, another bizarre detail. As as you researched all these cases, did you come across other bizarre creatures besides Bigfoot? Yeah, yeah, I'll run into all kinds of stuff from a lot of river monsters, you know, things that are large snakes and river monsters. Um, Anything like Nessie or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, there'll, there'll be some reports of, of large serpents and stuff. One of my favorites was from 1905 in York County, Pennsylvania. Um, a creature walked out of the Susquehanna River that they said was a man-sized fish with legs. Jeez. Yeah. So they're, they're, How do they make this stuff up, Tim? I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> they couldn't. I don't think so. I, there's, there's just some wild stuff. I mean, they've there. obviously have been witnessed to something. Yes, yes. And that's my point about the when people are describing not only the looks of the creatures, so, okay, they're describing a big hairy monster. Maybe that's something that's in the human subconscious that uh, we could possibly see or something in, in a sort of Jungian-type way. Maybe that's something we could see throughout time. But when they're describing the behavior of the creatures, and these behaviors match, the stone throwing, the, the killing of dogs, the knocking on windows and jiggling door handles or, or hitting the sides of houses, these behaviors we see in reports throughout time. And that's what really convinces me that, that people aren't making stuff up. No, not, not at all in the, in the least. You've done illustrations on some of this too, haven't you? Yeah, both. actually all three of my books are, are illustrated. Yeah, And you do it. Yes, yeah, I'm an illustrator. I was an illustrator before I was an author, so I, I started as an illustrator. Well, we've got the link to your website, folks. Go ahead and take a look at some of Timothy's work. Okay, welcome back to Coast to Coast. Paul Bartholomew is an investigative researcher, author. He has been investigating cryptozoology and paranormal phenomena for more than 40 years. Back in 2004, he wrote and lobbied for the Sasquatch Protective Ordinance, which passed unanimously proclaiming both the town and village of Whitehall, New York, to be a protective habitat for Bigfoot. We'll talk about that, too. Paul holds a B.S. degree in communications from the Castleton University. He studied under the late Dr. Warren L. Cook. Lectures a lot on UFOs to parapsychology and cryptozoology as well. Paul Bartholomew on Coast to Coast. Hey, Paul, good to have you. Hi, George. How are you? Good. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, me too. Uh, I'm a longtime fan of your show. I used to listen uh, back in the early 90s, and many of your affiliates, I used to listen to the shows uh, uh, years before that in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I love it. It's, uh, it's a program that just keeps growing because, Paul, folks like you, great guests, great researchers, keep giving us the great material to keep going. Well, thanks. There, there's so much out there. Tell me about the Sasquatch Protective Ordinance. How did that start? Well, uh, back in 2003, there was a, a documentary crew that came through, 2002-2003, uh, Doug Hijack, and they put together for the Outdoor Life Network a program called Mysterious Encounters. And so we did a documentary, uh, half an hour long, on uh, big, uh, Mysterious Encounters, the creature of Whitehall. And I thought, geez, this is... if. There was ever a better time because everybody was was focused on the subject and we were uh, doing interviews with uh, Bigfoot witnesses in this region. I said this would be the time to pass it. So I proposed this to the town and the village of Whitehall, and they both passed it unanimously to make uh, the Whitehall region a uh, protective habitat for the Sasquatch. And it it works on various levels. Uh, It acknowledges that this phenomena is here and that there's a long history of it. This isn't anything new or modern or pop. This is something that goes back uh, hundreds of years in this region, in the, in the Northeast, from the uh, Algonquin and the Iroquois right up to the uh, modern-day police sightings that we've had in this region. 
So uh, we we decided to uh, name it in honor of uh, Professor Warren Cook, who was the uh, professor who I studied under at Castleman University. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of research together on uh, hairy bipedal creatures sighted in the Northeast. What do you say to people, Paul, who say Bigfoot is not real, doesn't exist? How do you you counter that? Yes, I I understand uh, that argument because we don't have a body. But simply because we don't have the uh, proof positive doesn't mean that these creatures aren't out there. And there's something being cited, there's absolutely no question about it, uh, that we have reputable witnesses, we have very interesting uh, evidence through uh, castings that have been collected and preserved and plaster uh, of footprints and so forth. Uh, There are vocalizations that have been recorded that uh, we haven't been able to explain. Uh, So there's a lot of uh, circumstantial evidence that these creatures are there. I think the most compelling is the eyewitness reports uh, by uh, law enforcement officials. And we've had several here in Whitehall. So I understand that argument. And, I, you know, it'd be a lot easier if there was a body. But simply because there isn't a body doesn't mean that uh, the, these creatures aren't real. And I can give you a modern example of that. The catamount, the panther, isn't supposed to be in this region, in, in the Northeast, uh, in, in New York and Vermont and so forth. And yet there are just hundreds, scores of reports of the catamount all the time. And uh, my uncle, who was a doctor at the Mayo Clinic, uh, uh, had a home in Pulteney, Vermont, actually filmed one of these catamounts crossing his yard. And he had witnesses with him at the time. It was literally, you know, uh, noon, uh, broad daylight. And this thing slowly walked across, you know, long tail and so forth. And yet the Department of Environmental Conservation will tell you there aren't any catamounts in this area. And yet he had all sorts of evidence that there was. So there's a modern example of a creature that uh, also hasn't been proven in this area that I also believe is, is here. Paul, you wrote the book Bigfoot Encounters in New York and New England with your brother Robert. Uh, has he been a uh, crypto guy for a long time? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, we uh, Bob used to uh, um, work with uh, Arcturus Books, and so he got some of the best materials on the paranormal, uh, you know, firsthand. Uh, uh, and and Bob has always been uh, researching this type of phenomena. And you know, we grew up in this small town on a rural farm, in which we had a, a major. Uh, Bigfoot incident back in 1976 called the Bear Road incident. So I think that really sparked our interest in this. And, and I think we we're both interested in the UFO topic. Oh, well, there's a lot we're going to talk with you about. Tell us about the Bear uh, incident. Right. That was 1976 in August. Uh, and, and basically what happened is you had teenagers out on a rural country road. And, you know, they're, they're out doing their teenage uh, things, driving along, and, and they saw something walking beside uh, the road on Bear Road near a telephone pole. So they sped away, and they actually picked up a, a third teenager, and then they all went back to the site, and they parked near that area, and they waited to see just what it was they had seen. They, they weren't sure. They, they, you know, they'd seen this large creature, and they shut their lights off, and they, uh, they heard a commotion. They turned on their lights, and there was this creature. They sped away. They left about 60 feet of black rubber in the road, uh, speeding away, and they reported it to the police in town. And back in those days, you used to have a dispatcher. The, the, things weren't handled through county. You would have your own town dispatcher, and he was on duty at the police station, and he would relay the calls. Well, uh, the call went out, and uh, the Whitehall Police, uh, Washington County Deputy Sheriff, and the uh, New York State Police all responded to the scene. And in this incident, over a week-long period, we've had as many as 14 eyewitnesses. Many were police officials. Several won't talk about it to this day. Those that have gone on record, some have gone on publicly, uh, felt that this was definitely a negative in their careers. Law enforcement and Bigfoot apparently do not mix. And, uh, you know, no one wants to be known as the Bigfoot cop, you know, <laughs> and, and so forth. So uh, we have this highly credible incident. This was the talk of the town back then. Uh, it, when you picked up our local newspaper, which was the Post Star out of Glens Falls, it was front page news. 
uh, and if you turn down the media, the the Albany news stations were all up here. The uh, Tracy Egan, uh, a famous anchor in this area, was a reporter back then, and she was actually doing a field report from the from A Bear Road. So this was a huge incident. The town was really split wide open on whether you accepted this as a real phenomena or if it was some sort of hoax. And it really uh, uh, was an exciting time. And I remember as a as a, a young young kid, uh, uh, this was this was uh, a scary thing. Uh, uh, it was it was literally the talk of the town. Wasn't there a recent survey in your neck of the woods though that shows that most people are beginning to believe that Bigfoot is real? That's that's the wonderful thing that's happened uh, over the you know the four decades of research I've done. Back then, this was kind of a taboo topic. You would talk to police officials and, and county officials off the record. Uh, people would tell you their stories, don't use my name. And now it's sort of come full circle. And now they've somewhat embraced this phenomenon. I think part of that was the legislation we drew up to draw attention to it, that this wasn't anything that was new. It, it, this is a part of our heritage and part of our culture, and that uh, we should embrace it, not shun it. And now we do have a, a sort of a, a much more open uh, relationship with this this uh, very strange phenomena. In fact, they're going to have a festival here in Whitehall uh, in honor of the creature uh, uh, Saturday. Wouldn't it be great if the creature showed up? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I should clarify that Saturday the uh, 24th. Um, yes, uh, that always happens in the uh, monster movies. <laughs> well, no, you're right. Saturday the 24th is this Saturday. Right, right. So, so it's coming up. Tell me about the paranormal outbreak that you uh, described in the, the 76 Whitehall episode. Yeah, th- that's the thing. The, the uh, uh, creature sighting, we, we had this, this large creature that was, uh, you know, about seven feet tall, walking on two legs, hair-covered, had red glowing eyes and made us sound like a pig squealing or a woman screaming. Uh, but And people equate the Abair Road incident with just that, just a creature outbreak. Turns out that this was a paranormal outbreak. We had all sorts of activity going on. Uh, when we look into the UFO field, we find out that in 1976 in August, we were in the midst of a major UFO flap, a wave of sightings that covered the uh, surrounding counties around Whitehall. And it actually went down as far as the Indian Point nuclear plant down in uh, Rockland County. There were sightings down in that region as well. So this was a major UFO flap, not just a uh, creature outbreak. And uh, we also had... Uh, one of the stranger things, I talked with the police dispatcher, Bob Martell, who was the dispatcher on duty that evening when the Abair Road incident broke. And he said he couldn't recall whether it was a week before or a week after, but there was a UFO landing in the town of Whitehall. And it was reported by an, uh, a woman on 2nd Avenue. And if you were to look at a map of the avenues in Whitehall, it's, it's all houses. And this is the most, this is the oddest place you would expect a UFO landing to take place. And yet the woman reported it. She's literally only a couple streets over from the police station. So uh, Bob Martell and, and the uh, on duty sergeant, uh, Wilfred Goslin, both went to her home. And while, when they got there, she said the object had taken off again, uh, but it was circular and it left about a 12 foot patch of matted down grass in her yard. And I talked with Bob Martell. He said that he reached down and he could still feel the heat coming off of the grass that had been matted down in this swirled uh, pattern. So we have a really strange UFO landing that took place as well. Now, as we kept researching, we found out that there were hunter reports as well from that time period in which they saw big birds, uh, whether it be a thunderbird or uh, they described it as a pterodactyl-like creature. And they were stunned, and they said it almost looked like, and this is a direct quote, liquid reality. Uh, You could almost see it was almost transparent. So we have the big bird phenomena, we have the uh, Hmm. UFO flap, the creature phenomena, a UFO landing. This was a paranormal outbreak. The big bird stories are fascinating to me because these creatures either have feathers or they don't, as you've said, and 
You mean, have they ever, like, swooped down and picked up an animal or anything like that? We don't have any reports of that uh, from this region, but it, it was one of those odd reports that, uh, you know, as a researcher, I, I am compelled to lay the case out as it happens, not as I want it to. And, uh, you know, it'd be a lot easier with these creatures if they didn't have red glowing eyes, if, they, if all the footprints were, you know, uniform. But we get three toes and five. We get the big bird reports. We get these uh, creature reports, uh, the, the uh, bipedal hairy hominids with red glowing eyes. Uh, and it's just the way the, the material is, 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 you know, you have to record it, and maybe it'll mean something later. You want to be as accurate as possible. So uh, this is just one of those reports that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to throw it. I just want to lay it out there, and this is, this is how it was reported to us. Paul, with the, some of these stories, and you mentioned it, that, you know, there, there are no bodies. People don't have any real hard evidence I'm not even sure we have DNA at this point. When do we get this stuff? Excellent question, and I fully accept that argument as, uh, you know, for the the hard-nosed skeptic that wants the body. I don't think this will ever be solved without a body, uh, uh, unfortunately. And uh, Dr. Cook felt that this would be solved by a logging truck on a bad curve and that eventually something like that would happen. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, you have that controversy, should they be shot? Uh, you know, they, some people felt like Krantz that we should shoot them and, and bring one in and solve the mystery. And Cook felt that this would be uh, uh, despicable. And Cook w- was strongly against that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I agree. We should have a body, but we don't. And maybe there's uh, more of a paranormal element going on here than, than we uh, fully understand. This red eye phenomena is fascinating. I looked at reports going back hundreds of years, and they talk about the, the descriptions, even though they're a different time period, they, uh, they use the same type of uh, vernacular, a different vernacular, but the same description. Uh, eyes that glowed in the dark. Uh, eyes of flame. Uh, some would say bloodshot eyes. Uh, ferocious, ape-looking creature with... Uh, Eyes like pools of blood, uh, like burning embers is another quote. So uh, this is uh, an interesting characteristic, and one that popped up a year before the Abair Road sightings, before there was this big, uh, uh, you know, excitement about the creature in this town, when Cliff Sparks, who was the owner of the Skeen Valley Country Club on uh, Norton Road in Whitehall, and uh, Cliff was out on the greens off of green number one, uh, he had driven his, his electric cart out there, and he had his dog with him, and he was uh, tending to the hoses. It was about 11 o'clock in the evening. And he saw a creature standing on the green. But he said this creature that was about seven feet tall with a conical-shaped head, and uh, he, he thought it was as scared of him as he was of it. Uh, he said that it had not, not just red glowing eyes, but almost the, the eyes were emanating from the creature, not reflective, but actually like beams of light. And uh, he, he always stuck by that description, and it's one that we found in, these old, uh, in the old vernacular of older reports as well. So this red glowing eyes may be a key that we're dealing with, with something much more sophisticated, much more uh, maybe of a paranormal nature. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain that. Only that we get this report very, uh, not always, but it's very common. Very common indeed. Paul, during the, your your work and your investigating, when you use the phrase cryptozoology, what does that mean to you? Well, uh, from a technical aspect, uh, cryptozoology it would be the search for hidden animals. And in this regard, uh, you, you know, it may cross into when you deal with the John Keel research, when you deal with, you know, some of the great research that Brad Steiger's done, you may cross into that paranormal aspect as well. But uh, from a general sense, uh, it, it would mean that the search for hidden or undiscovered creatures. I like that. And there are many undiscovered creatures still, aren't there? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, we, we have uh, the, the one thing that uh, the Bigfoot phenomena is different from some is that when we look at things like the chupacabra, 
we can trace that back so many years. Uh, it, you know, maybe from the mid-90s, you could make a case. Uh, it was a, you know, a few decades before that, a couple of sightings. But when you trace the Bigfoot phenomena, you can go back hundreds of years and uh, Cook felt thousands of years in Chinese records. Uh, whether they're talking about stone giants or giant men of the mountains from the Iroquois and the Algonquin, uh, the Abenaki, you know, we talked of Wendigo, the Onondaga talked of the northern giants. Uh, if you get up into the Quebec area, they talked about the Kokoshi. Um, Samuel Champlain in the 1600s talked about and, and wrote about, I should say, wrote about the, uh, the uh, Gal Gal. So uh, these reports are, are so consistent that uh, they're sort of different from some of the paranormal aspects. But, uh, yeah, that the red glowing eyes does pop up, and it is a common characteristic. Paul, I want to get into your book when we come back after the break, Bigfoot Encounters in New York in New England and what's happening there. But have you ever had any reports of a Bigfoot hurting a human being? I haven't heard of any. Personally, I haven't in this region. Uh, there are some... Uh, uh, more aggressive reports. There are. There was a report that Lorraine Warren had worked on, I think, down in the Tennessee border, in which uh, a creature tried to grab a boy, but she thought it wasn't an aggressive measure, uh, but it was sort of reaching out in a, in a curious way. Uh, we have reports of these creatures peeking in windows and things like that, but usually the aggression is taken on the part of people, and many hunters have... Uh, allegedly shot at the creatures. We had a, 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 one of the incidents that occurred at the end of the outbreak on Bear Road was a hunter who had actually shot uh, two weapons at a creature. He said at a huge creature that came at him on Sea Falls Road, which is Carver Falls Road, an offshoot of Bear Road. And that's actually in the police logs at the, the Whitehall Police Station. How many creatures do you think are out there, Paul, somewhere hidden away in the woods? Oh, I, I don't know what the number would be uh, uh, as far as uh, the Bigfoot phenomenon. This this region, it's so consistent and such a long pattern that there there must be, uh, you know, I would think in the low estimate thousands. Uh, but you know, the, the Bigfoot encounter, uh, the, the Bigfoot mystery. If you expand this from uh, New England into the United States, you have you know the the swamp ape in uh, Florida, uh, the skunk ape, I'm sorry, in Florida, you Mm -hmm. have the swamp monster, you have uh, uh, Momo in Missouri, uh, falk monster in Arkansas. So these creatures are very common in different regions. And if you expand that throughout the world, you have, you know, the Yeti or the abominable snowman in the Himalayas, you have the Elmista or Elmisti in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Uh, Dr. Cook was able to travel to China back in the uh, 1985, and he exchanged information with the Chinese government and, and researchers on their creature there called the Che Rin or the wild man. And so uh, where my brother used to live in Australia, he's in New Zealand now, but if you were to go to Australia, it would be called uh, uh, the Yowie or the Yahoo. And uh, there's a couple of researchers down there, uh, uh, Tony Healy, uh, Paul Cropper, who've done, uh, you know, tremendous history research on that creature. So th- this is a global enigma. And we were just, you know, back in the 70s, we were just flabbergasted because we thought of Bigfoot as being out west in California and up into British Columbia and stuff. Uh, but we had it here literally in our own backyards. And uh, so that was the emphasis for the book was to take a look at the New England encounters and see just how many there are. And it seems to be much more common than people originally thought. What do you think of this story, Paul? Somebody called me during open lines a couple of years ago, and we were talking about things, creatures, and he said that he was fishing and caught two large fish, and he was holding them, and all of a sudden appeared a Bigfoot right next to him. And he said, this thing was looking at me, looking at the fish. I was scared to death. I handed back, I handed him the two fish, and he took it. Then he looked at me, looked at the fish, and gave me one back. Now, does that make sense? Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I, 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 you know, it's an interesting report, and as a researcher, I would note it the same way you did, exactly as it was reported, and get as many details as possible, and maybe that'll mean something later on down the road. Uh, maybe that's a primate-type behavior. 
we know that w- with uh, primates like uh, Coco the gorilla and so forth, we've actually been able to, to teach sign language. And there's actually a communication, a dialogue that happens. And I know with some of these researchers and some witnesses who've encountered the Bigfoot phenomena, there's almost a rapport that develops between these creatures. And uh, I can remember back in the uh, late 70s, the uh, birth of the Kinderhook creature down in Kinderhook, uh, New York, which is about 10 miles south of Albany. Bruce Hallenbeck, who's a, a terrific researcher down there and, and uh, has researched this for many, many years, his family was involved. His grandmother had a sighting of a creature down there that was curled up in the fetal position, and, and she thought it was a bear. It stood up and walked away, and she reported it to the local media, and they dubbed it the Kinderhook creature. Well, she told me one time, she said that uh, you know she was just scared and wished it would all go away, and then a short time later, a few years later, she said, you know, I kind of miss it because it was exciting and interesting. And so, yes, there's sort of a rapport that sometimes develops between people and, and these creatures. Paul, let's talk more about some of the theories behind these creatures. We hear that they're physical creatures, they're animal, human, there's a link. We've heard they're dimensional, they might be extraterrestrial. What are they, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I wish I knew. Um as a researcher, I just take in the evidence, and, and, you know, whatever, you know, you develop as a theory is fine with me. Uh, we have the physical, uh, the group that believes this is a physical flesh and blood creature. And uh, uh, from that camp, you would have uh, Dr. Cook felt that these were a form of Australopithecus boisei, which would be an ancient, uh, you know, an ancient relative of us. Uh, Grover Krantz, the Washington State uh, anthropologist and expert on, on these creatures, he felt that we we're dealing with Gigantopithecus, which is uh, a theory amongst many researchers today in the uh, physical camp, that these are physical creatures. And uh, that that's uh, basically an, an ancient gorilla. So uh, we have that, that aspect of it. Now, if we look at the uh, people that look at the characteristics like the red glowing eyes and the, sometimes the tracks that disappear in the middle of the field, they feel that we're dealing with something that's more of a psychical nature or paranormal nature. And, you know, uh, uh, one of your co-broadcasters there, George Knapp, uh, who wrote The uh, Hunt for the Skinwalker, yeah. that steps right into this type of territory where we have all these phenomena that sort of overlap. And, uh, you know, I, I have to think that at this point, I think there is an element here that we just don't understand. So I think that down the road, there may be a major breakthrough. Uh, But uh, the consistent thing is that these creatures aren't going anywhere. Uh, This phenomena is as consistent as, as our own histories. You know, Paul, with people who have witnessed these uh, creatures, they're pretty compelling stories. They don't Absolutely. sound like they're making them up. No, and, and, and one of the things that separates Whitehall from, from some regions is the uh, number of police encounters we've had in this region. And for the witness of this creature, particularly a Bigfoot, this is a, a uh, uh, they have everything to lose and nothing to gain by coming forward with their accounts. And in many cases, they're sacrificing their careers. Uh, a good uh, a neighbor of mine who lived in Whitehall, I went to school with him, his name was Dan Gordon, He's, he passed away recently. Uh, he had a sighting of a creature, one of the most common Bigfoot-type creatures that uh, sightings there are is a road crossing. And he was on patrol with another officer. Uh, they were heading out by South Bay, South Whitehall, and they... Had, they would make their loop and turn around and come back towards town on patrol. It was about four four thirty in the evening, in the uh, morning rather, and they saw the creature cross the road in front of their police cruiser. They pulled over the cruiser. Uh, the gentleman that was with Dan, uh, he actually stayed in the car while Dan got out with his weapon drawn, and whatever this creature was had already. Uh, you know, negotiated the rocky terrain and and had gotten far away from him. But uh, Dan Gordon said to me one day, he he had been interviewed, he didn't talk about this for 22 years publicly. 
and then he decided to go on camera one day and, and but not use his name and then he finally decided he said I want to get this out because I saw this and he went on a couple of documentaries and in fact in one of the documentaries uh, this encounter happened back in the 80s or 1982 and in one of the documentaries they did a recreation where he actually supervised the recreation uh, giving them some you know description as to what actually went on so it's very accurately done for the history channel and uh, Dan said to me one day, he says, you know, I'll take a polygraph. And I said, you know, Dan, nobody is asking to. He says, I want to. And so I got in touch with with the History Channel, and they uh, arranged for an episode where he took a polygraph mm-hmm. along with uh, two other witnesses. And they passed. They had the state uh, polygraph expert come up and, and give them the exam, and he said there was no, no deception. He went further. He met with... Uh, uh, forensic sketch artist. And, you know, when you sketch out something uh, from the uh, uh, police uh, sketch artist, uh, it's not like the TV shows where they just draw it and it's done in about five minutes. It's a process. And he sat in my living room here with, with her, and, and they went over this sketch for a good three hours. And at the end of the sketch, I'll never forget it, she says, I want you to close your eyes. And Dan closed his eyes, and he said, and she said, I want you to open them back up, and when you do, look at that sketch and tell me how close we are on a scale of 1 to 10. And Dan did that, and he looked at the sketch, and he says, it's a 9.5 because a 10 is up here, and he pointed to his head. And so, I mean, that's how much this encounter changed his life and his perspective on what was going on, and he had to keep this as a deep, dark secret for years and years. And what my main goal in this is to, people like Dan Gordon, they shouldn't have to burden themselves with keeping a secret like that. They should be able to talk about it openly. And I hope we have a better understanding of what's going on and the the high credibility of witnesses that have seen these things. And, uh, you know, back in the 1976 Abair Road incident, many of those police officials uh, never came forward, and some felt that it was definitely had been a negative on their lives. How many sightings are you getting now in the New York, New England area? It's it's a consistent pattern of sightings. We we get them uh, generally weekly here, uh, but it, we break them down into incidents. So we have uh, an incident would be either a sighting, uh, track find, or a vocalization report. And we just keep logs of them and, and the locations and, and keep them, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as organized as possible to, to look for patterns and flaps and things like that. And uh, there was recently a report in August of this year uh, in Bells Falls, Vermont, on uh, Route 121. And that's uh, uh, back Westminster Road is the name of it. Three people reported to the police that they had seen a monkey crossing the road. You don't hear this very often in Vermont. And uh, so uh, the police chief there, actually, they put it on a Facebook post, and they had such a reaction to it, they took the post down, and he said this has gotten out of of hand. He he didn't want any more inquiries about it because there's so much uh, uh, interest in that topic. Now, there was a report in July 2013 of two boys in Sudbury, Vermont. I have no question in my mind that these two boys witnessed something extraordinary. And their grandmother was literally just across the road, and she came running when they were yelling to her. And it was kind of funny. They were like kids. We used to do this. We would take a handful of rocks and throw them at a tree or a telephone pole and, uh, you know, play baseball or something. And they were taking rocks, and they were chucking them at a large tree. And all of a sudden, this creature darted out of the woods and stopped and stared at them. And they were stunned. And uh, the younger brother had a rock in his hand. He was ready to throw it. And he says to his older brother, he says, should I throw it? And the older brother said, no, no, don't throw it. No. And they watched this creature for a good uh, 20, 30 seconds. And they were, they were so close that they could describe on the face, they saw what looked like sideburns. And... Uh, this, these are the types of confirmation reports, Dan Gordon's, these, these two boys in Sudbury, uh, uh, Cliff Sparks sighting. These are those confirmation reports where you know that the person is honest, you've known them uh, you know, quite a while, the, the, the reputations are solid, and you're wondering, my God, what did they see? And they definitely saw something unusual. Now, my favorite report was from June 2004. We had two Hong Kong nationals 
that were fishing up in Clemens, New York. And they got to their fishing spot and cast their poles in, and they look over, and there's this large ape, uh, what they call the uh, gorilla, uh, wading through the water. And one of them said to the others, I didn't know you had uh, had uh, monkeys up here. And I, I said to the uh, one of the gentlemen, I said, well, what'd you do? And he said, well, we went fishing. Well, that's a terrific report because in his cultural uh, you know, in his culture, it wasn't unusual to have monkeys around and things. He just didn't know that they were in this area, and so he had no way. He had no idea what he was looking at. Has the creature changed its appearance over the last fifty years? Uh, I I think that it's it's remained incredibly consistent, and if it was a sociological. Uh, psychological type of enigma, I think you would see changes. But we get this red glowing eyes thing goes way back. Uh, we get the, the large, the conical-shaped head. Uh, it remains pretty consistent, and I, I think that's uh, uh, very interesting. I do, too. I too. And I've always believed, Paul, that this was a physical creature. And when I was a kid, I always thought it was the missing link between ape and man. You know, even the skeptic that says, look, there's nothing to this, I will argue with them forever, not that, you know, this is real or not real, but that from a skeptical point of view, from a sociological, anthropological point of view, this is an important thing to study because this phenomena is global. This is reputable people seeing this. If it's not a real creature, then what are they seeing from a psychological or sociological point of view? It's important to study. So as far as the skeptical argument goes, uh, this is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I I think it is, too. Now, you've looked at other things other than just Bigfoot, haven't you? Yeah, the the, uh, thing that really got me hooked, and I'll never forget it, was the 1973 UFO flap. And I would have been uh, nine years old. I remember that like it was yesterday. Uh, That was an exciting time. And, you you know, uh, just uh, um, off of that for a second, this is the anniversary of Betty Hill. Is it really? uh, That's right. That's right. Um, You know, probably the most famous abduction case in the Northeast. Um, But that 1973 case. Uh, the flap. We had Pascagoula, Mississippi, Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker. We had the coin helicopter chase out in uh, Ohio. Uh, that was an exciting time. And in this region, we had scores of UFO sightings in the, the Rochester, New York area. We had an actual landing of something at the La Cabana restaurant out on Glen Lake. And uh, uh, we don't know what that is to this day. Uh, something landed in the parking lot and created these swirled patterns in the dirt parking lot, and it was actually powerful enough that it threw dirt up against the door. That They had to get a shovel to get the dirt away from the door to get in the next day. And that became a famous UFO landing case that was investigated. I think back then it was the National Investigations Committee on Aero Phenomena had uh, investigated it. NICAP. NICAP. Yeah. yeah, and uh, uh that was a, a really interesting case, and one of the interesting parts of it is that the hot water tap to the restaurant ran cold, and the cold water tap ran hot, and they could never explain this. But you know what it is? That's an indication that this is something real, something physical actually happened uh, that evening, and this was during a major UFO flap in this region as well in the Northeast. Uh, so uh, I actually talked to a scientist uh, uh, Robert Schroeder at a, a convention one time, and I asked him about this case, and he gave me an interesting... He felt that, you know, with many of the UFO sightings, there's a electromagnetic field involved with the sighting. And he felt that that may have changed the polarities on the valves. So we actually had a physical uh, case there, physical landing case here in, in uh, 1973, and that really got me hooked. And once you get interested in the ufo phenomena you're introduced into all these other realms whether you're reading john keel or or uh, brad steiger i mean these were pioneers in the 
the research of uh, of the paranormal, and they were years. I mean, Brad Steiger was uh, you know decades ahead of himself with what he what he, what he was writing about. Uh, John Keel was touching on topics that. Uh, you, you know, we're only now beginning to understand through quantum physics what uh, possibly the implications are. Hello and welcome to Coast to Coast AM's official YouTube channel. I'm your host, George Norrie. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel. And you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and of course, on coasttocoastam.com. In a moment, a breaking story on Bigfoot. You don't want to miss it. We'll be back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Now, you know, listening to this program over the years, that one of our missions to get vital information on the possible existence of Bigfoot. We've got a story for you tonight that uh, I think is going to just make you wake up and go, oh, my gosh. Mitchell Townsend recently co-authored a scientific paper proving the possible existence of Bigfoot at Mount St. Helens in the state of Washington. The conclusions, confirmed, verified, have not been disproven or even questioned by 30 PhDs that have looked at it. Additionally, Mitchell has taught a couple groundbreaking Bigfoot courses at the college level, and we are going to bring him in for this hour as we talk about this incredible story. Mitchell, first of all, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, George, for having me. I'm very pleased to be here. Tell me about this scientific study. Well, it began in about 2013, the spring of. I was uh, at the foothills of Mount St. Helens and came across a very interesting stack of bones that turned out to be a stack of deer bones that had seemingly giant human teeth marks taken out of them. And consequently, I did some research and came to the conclusion that there was no currently classified carnivore taxa present at Mount St. Helens that would explain that behavior. Thus, I put together a program to try to initiate uh, additional information uh, possibilities. And with that, I taught two classes at a couple of the local colleges in my area. Um, In 2014, two of my former students came across two similar stacks of bones on the other side of Mount St. Helens that had very similar giant hominin front incisor teeth marks. We call them dental avulsion attributed injuries. After a significant amount of research, we determined that there was a a comparison and collaboration between these three geographically separated prey bone assemblage sites, and we went further from there and did a huge amount of research uh, in contemporary citations, scientific citations, to determine, indeed, if this was a possibility. Uh, I also did contact the Department of Fish and Wildlife here in Washington State they did a preliminary assessment of this bone stacking behavior, and they assured me that, no, indeed, that there wasn't any currently classified carnivore taxa that could possibly be responsible for that type of material alone. After that, we did some significant measuring, measurements on all of the teeth structural signatures, and after about nine months' worth of very intensive research, we came to some very provocative conclusions that included the possibilities uh, at that time now confirmed that a giant hominin creature uh, had lived and had been living uh, in the Mount St. Helens vicinity for some time. Were you able, Mitchell, to extract any kind of DNA samples from the bones? At this point, we haven't done that, but we do have flesh still attached to the bones. And we've been in contact with world-renowned DNA geneticists who assured us that that material is indeed present. Based on the bike mark marks, uh, Mitchell, how big do you think this hominid might be and the, its, its size, its head? How big is this? At this point, we based our an analysis on a NASA extrapolation from the average Homo sapien which averages about 5 foot 9 inches with a foot length of 10.76 inches by 3.6 inches. If you extrapolate those measurements, we came to the conclusion that our unidentified hominin species is approximately 8 feet 8 inches tall with a 16-inch footprint by 7 inches by 4.5 on the heel with a stride of 72 inches, correction, a step length of 72 inches and a stride of 144 inches both of which are double the size and length of any modern contemporary Homo sapien, thus outside possibility. 
My God. And that description alone, Mitchell, echoes what a lot of people who have apparently witnessed creatures like Bigfoot in the Washington state area. That's absolutely incredible. Not only incredible, scientifically confirmed through forensic dental analysis. Tell me about some of these 30 PhDs that have uh, that this has been sent to for analysis. What kind of feedback are you getting? At this point, we haven't received a huge amount of significant feedback because we understand that they're still trying to poke holes in our research. After 30 days, we haven't received one incidence of even questioning our scientific results. At this point, we have seven confirmed forensic dental characteristics and one very possible which uh, dental characteristic, which would be called shovel-shaped incisors, and that is primarily a diagnostic characteristic of Neanderthal man, which approximately died out 12,500 years ago. So what we have is a series of interlocking forensic dental analysis signatures that are homo erectus, homo sapien in nature, yet size through size measurement and extrapolated analysis are more than double the size in seven different scientifically confirmed categories, with one being almost scientifically confirmed and will be confirmed through uh, microdermal abrasion analysis. Mitchell, if a human tooth is about uh, a quarter of an inch wide, how, how big do you think these teeth are? Well, we looked at averages, average human teeth structures, because it's important to understand that there is a very in- large interspecies variability ratio between different types of populations. And so what we did was we went back to the scientific literature and found a upper incisor measurement of approximately 6.5 millimeters to 8.5 millimeters, which covered approximately 82% of the world's population with a plus or minus accuracy ratio of 0.5 millimeters. This, this could very well be one of the most exciting stories about Bigfoot I have ever, ever heard. You know, we've always had this situation where people have tried to hoax things, where they, you know, had, they had a costume and stuffed it with deer, deer guts and things like that, uh, or the possibility of DNA, which may or may not be the fact. But this story, Mitchell, I, I, I don't know. This has some incredible credibility to it. It's the evidence that we maintain is available free of charge for any scientist or anybody anywhere to examine and reconfirm our measurements. This is forensic dental science. This is material that's hard science that cannot be faked. There were no tool marks, no fire damage, no predator correction, no scavenger marks. So this creature had marked that territory with whatever, probably an olfactory substance, and thus, all of the naturally occurring behaviors resident to those populations of scavengers uh, were not occurring. And so consequently, what we have is a, what we feel is a hunting range or a hunting home range uh, based upon our analysis of two different types of science. One is called forensic dental taphonomy. The other is called neoecnology. And both of these sciences are subdivisions of paleontology, very well recognized scientific uh, uh, analysis. And between our integrated um, research schematics, we were able to not only measure the teeth, look at the different types of dental signatures and confirm them with the contemporary literature, but also we also found tracks uh, within a quarter of a mile of two of the deposition sites. And we were able to track that back 100 yards and reconstruct the track line. And that gave us the measurements on step and stride length, which we could extrapolate into height measurements. Mitchell, what uh, what are you doing to get the word out about this incredible scientific proof? Uh, are you are you holding some national news conferences? What can you do beyond this show to get the word out? Well, I've actually done a few newspaper articles and a number of other podcast interviews. Unfortunately, with this type of research, it's very fine uh, line as far as uh, a number of different items. We are trying to visit all the boards, uh, including the BFRO website, and engage in a number of different ways with a number of different constituencies so we can get the word out as broadly as possible. Part of that is a multi-level peer review process. So we're trying to put this information out in front of the whole world, the public, and allow the 
uh, the people that have questions, including the academic community, the scientific community, and including the Bigfoot community to engage us in our research. And we challenge everyone to try to poke holes in the research uh, as per the scientific method requires. And one other thing I did want to mention is we did have also conclusive evidence of another animal or organism at one of the sites um, as scientifically uh, conclusive evidence emerged with mammalons or small protuberances on the uh, incisors of a juvenile, in this case, homo sapien human, contemporary human, that huh. come out on their teeth approximately 11 years old and are worn down at approximately 16 years old. So we do have two different size organisms that we have scientific conclusive proof of. Um, uh, a probably an adult Bigfoot in a in a in a teenager type. That is correct. How close do these incisions, these teeth marks, w- resemble that of a bear bite? They're not even close, and that's one of the issues that we had. Is we wanted to conclusively. Um, take all of the currently known classified carnivore taxa out of the equation. That was one of the reasons that we coordinated with the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as did a very conclusive, very important um, and intricate examination of all the, we call it dentition morphophysiological structures of all the different animals. And these are obviously human-type dentition signature structures. Uh, A side-by-side comparison uh, illuminates that quite conclusively. Mitchell, how long have you been seeking out the possibility of finding proof about Bigfoot? How many years? Probably only about four years, um, very uh, significantly. We've made a number of different discoveries, uh, none of which we were able to scientifically uh, place within the current cited literature. And we were given this opportunity uh, a couple of years ago, to begin to develop this profile and the scientific dental aversion uh, techno correction signature um, issues, and we wanted to find a way in order to bring hard science analysis to a field that has uh, heretofore suffered from a number of fakes and hoaxes. Yes, and we feel that we've been able to conclusively prove this uh, through a number of different scientific um, dental aversion signatures and all of which are, once again, as I said, available to any scientist worldwide in order to poke holes in our research or try to reconfirm our database. And that is available, currently available to anyone who makes that request. So you are convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you have possible evidence which could tell the world that Bigfoot does exist. We don't call it Bigfoot. The name Bigfoot is not mentioned in our essay, okay. and we, wanted, we did that intentionally. Um, that is not our phraseology. We wanted to give mainstream science the ability to walk through this door, which they've been heretofore very hesitant to risk their reputation. We positioned our science within current contemporary literature with a side-by-side comparison. It, it's obvious, and we feel probably over 99% that we have solved this once and for all through forensic biotic taphonomy and neo uh, signatures, all coordinated, all mutually supporting. And the most important thing here is that all of this data, uh, to include the behavioral data and the forensic taphonomy, the, beha- the signatures of these tooth marks, um, are all mutually supporting. There's not one piece of evidence that stands out as an anomaly. All of this material is mutually supporting. And... In a nutshell, all of the teeth, the footprints, correction, the stride length and step length, all of the teeth, the bite radius, and the intercanine distance measurements all are confirmed, and they all are double the size of modern Homo sapiens. So what we have is an integrated pattern of individual types of data that are mutually self-supporting and mutually complementary with every other type of data. And all of this data is with easily side-by-side pictorial comparisons situated in current contemporary scientific canon. We Mitchell, feel that we've solved the Bigfoot once and for all. Could this be a giant that is just out there in the wilderness somewhere, a giant human being who's been there and his, uh, and his, and his uh, offspring have been there for years and years and years? 
that is a question that modern mainstream scientists are going to have to struggle with. Once they read our essay, they are going to come to the same conclusions that we are, that we have, and contemporary science as well as historical uh, information strongly suggests and has suggested that there is indeed a giant hominin-type creature that has been living in and around Mount St. Helens for hundreds of years. And we have Amazing story. physical, forensic, dental evidence that's conclusive, that can't be faked. There's no tool marks. This is hard science. This isn't video. This isn't picture. This isn't eyewitness. This is forensic dental evidence. Mitchell, that area where you have this discovery has gotten some incredible, as we call Sasquatch stories, incredible stories. So you add that to what you've got, you might be on to something. George, I think we have definitively solved this through science, hard science. And once again, we challenge the international community and the academic community, anthropological community, paleological community, to examine our results in person. We offer them to any scientist anywhere in the world free of charge in order to confirm or disconfirm our results. We are 100% confident that our science and our measurements and our extrapolations based on the evidence are correct. And that's why we offer them free of charge for anybody who wants to take a look. Another area where they have lots of Bigfoot sightings, Oregon. We're going to, going to Salem, Oregon now. Cheryl's with us. Hello, Cheryl. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. I was just curious. You just said they've probably been living up there hundreds of years, but I didn't know if these bones were like pre-Mount um, uh, St. Helen eruption of 1980 or, you know, after that, or if that had any, if they were still living up there, if you thought they were still, because you've had people on your show that had a lot of sightings and yeah. Mount Adams and over in the Blue Mountains. Well, uh, the fact they, that they the f- fact that there was some f- some flesh on it too, I would guess uh, Mitchell, and you can confirm that these bones came after the Mount St. Helens eruption. That is correct. These bones are fresh. The ones that I found were within a couple weeks old, and they were found in May of 2013. The other two sites were found approximately. September of 2014. These were fresh mm-hmm. kills that had fresh meat still attached to the bones. We still have that meat, which has saliva DNA evidence currently encased in those that, that meat structure. And interestingly enough, no scavenger marks on two of the sites and a very small amount on the third site, which we de- uh, designated elk site number two. And so consequently, these are fresh bones. We examine them and put them through a classification process to determine uh, the weatherization. Uh, They actually came in at the lowest possible weatherization. And the meat that is still attached is from the animals that were killed, but they were masticated by this organism and thus have saliva-based DNA currently encased. At this point, we've asked several DNA scientists, including... Well, I don't want to mention any names because I don't have their authorization to identify them on your show. But just like I said before, this material uh, that we've uh, previewed with two DNA, world-renowned DNA scientists have confirmed to us that, yes, indeed, there probably is DNA, saliva-based material, on that residual meat structure, but it has to be sifted down and contaminations, potential contaminations based upon my handling them uh, can be screened out. It's, it's really just about money. And once again, we offer that to the leading DNA geneticists in the world to examine, free of charge. That's fantastic. Where are the bones right now, Mitchell? The bones are with one of the co-authors, Mr. Gerald Mills. He was the one of the gentlemen who found both of the other sites, former students of mine. He has them under lock and key to include my samples as well. <clears throat> if And I believe this is just another naturally occurring species that has to eat, reproduces, communicates, migrates. And if that is indeed the case, then there has to be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. And we're not talking about just North America. We're talking about the whole world. There's been sightings and scientific information that came out, that's come out of Australia, that's come out of Europe. The literature stretching all the way back to the ancient Greek and Romans also make mention of these types of hirsute creatures. And so we have a worldwide phenomenon that is one of two things. It's either an intergenerational mass hallucination over thousands of years, 
or it's just a naturally occurring corporal preacher, which is what I believe. And what our research positively, conclusively proves is that hybrid, and I call it hybrid, mm-hmm. because the main theory is Gigantopithecus black eye that came across the Bering Sea land bridge over the last few ice ages. That's a Bindernagel, Dr. Bindernagel theory. We have a Dr. Meldrum theory who's one of the most world-renowned scientists in primatology that suggests, indeed, that it's a hybrid relic hominid. And our research, is, amazingly enough, supports his assertions that this is a hybrid creature. It's not an ape. And the reason I can definitively say that is because some of the, the tooth morphological structures are triangular preload impressions. Only humans have that cusp shape. A chimpanzee or a primate, a lower-level primate, would have circular impressions. So there's proof positive right there that we have hominid, not chimpanzee or great ape living at Mount St. Helens. Well, great work, Mitchell. Great work. Would you stay in touch with us? I would be pleased to stay in touch and do any type of follow-up. Absolutely. You you stay in touch with us, our producers, because uh, this is a great, incredible story. All right. So if you go to the coasttocoastam.com page, page, right? You click on tonight's show, Desert Strangeness slash Open Lines, and we'll we'll slash through some open lines coming up later on. Uh, you'll see links to um, M.L. Behrman's various work. For example, his website, his YouTube channel, uh, a- and to his book, uh, which, by the way, I like quite a bit. I found it, um, I, or maybe you've got, well, his nonfiction book, then he's got fiction books, too, which are always fun. But I found uh, Mojave Mysteries on my desk the other night. Uh, I was cleaning off my desk, and I found it, uh, ML. And I, I'd forgotten how much I dog-eared it and highlighted different passages in it. It's such a fun read, and it's a great accompaniment for the show tonight. It's nice to have you back on Coast to Coast. Well, thank you very much, sir. I'm glad to be here. Oh, man, you rock. So, um, so ML and I talk all the time, and, and, uh, and he, he sent me these photos. Before we get to that, I mean, I encourage you to go look at them. Uh, again, under tonight's show, Desert Strangeness, click onto that, uh, the parenthetical link. It just says uh, related images. But before we do that, for people who have missed your previous appearances on Coast to Coast, you, you have an interesting story to tell in that, you didn't set out to do what you found great success doing. You went to Hollywood. You were going to be a script writer. You did work on, on different uh, products over the years in Hollywood before you made it back to the desert. Just to explain that transition so people know a little bit more about you. Um, well, I had come to Hollywood, uh, like you say, to try and be a writer and uh, also work uh, in the art department because I was really into model making and stuff like that. And I got on a show that was going to do paranormal stuff, and they were going to shoot some of the episodes out in the desert, out everywhere from Palmdale to Joshua Tree to uh, up in the Mojave Preserve. And I started coming out, and I just fell in love with the area. Um, the show ended up not going anywhere, uh, but I loved it so much that I actually bought a house out here because um, it was cheaper to buy a house in the desert than it was to live in an apartment in Hollywood. I bet. And, um, you know, at first I thought I'd made the worst choice of my life because I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm on the far side of the moon out here. <laughs> um, but then I just, after a couple of weeks, I'm like, oh, I'm home. You know, I just, I just love this area. And I've always been a history buff. And going out and exploring the old mines and talking to people that uh, were prospectors or um, ranchers or whatever, uh, I started to hear stories from them. Um, now, I had always thought that the desert was strictly, you know, the background for a Western. You know, it was going to be cowboys and Indians and miners and, and ranchers. But then I started seeing and hearing how weird it was and how many people had a story. It was like everybody had a story, you know. And um, I just started collecting them and uh, not – with the idea of doing a book just because I thought, you know, it might be material somewhere down the line. Um, and the more I got, I actually started going out and, and trying to look into some things and uh, had a few experiences of my own that were really weird. And so I decided, well, you know, 
this is almost like an uncharted territory for a lot of people. Now, there are people that have written stuff and do radio shows about the desert, but um, the stories seem to be the same three or four stories recirculated a million times. Right. I, I wanted to find out different stuff, and then I, being a historian, I'd go look at the old archives of newspapers and, and journals and stuff like that and, and find out that a lot of these phenomenon have a pedigree that goes back one, two, three, four hundred years, you know, back to Native American times, and that they also seem to cluster around certain areas. And I just started getting more and more into it and more and more uh, following the story, so I decided, well, I'll do a book, and then I'll start doing some videos based on stories in the book and just try and, you know, develop the... uh, the idea around it, and and I always say it's it's. I always imagine myself as like the old nobleman who has the cabinet of curiosities, you know. Right. Like, okay, come look at this skull I found, or look at right. this weird thing, or you know. And uh, the desert to me is just one giant cabinet of curiosities. Yeah, but you also started writing the fiction uh, yeah, series, well, which is really cool. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I I came up with the idea of this monster hunter from the 1800s, you know, a cowboy who goes and takes up different jobs to track down creatures that at the time he didn't know what they were. And I would get it from, like, I spend a lot of time out by myself in the desert at night camping, and and I would kind of sit, you know, there on the rocks at, at night and think like, oh, wow, wouldn't it be scary if you were like, you know, a cowboy out here and, and right. you were on the, the trail of something. So it would just... It just became great fodder and atmosphere for additionally what I was doing. Well, I I, I love that it's sort of Zane Gray meets Coast to Coast, and it's a fun vibe, and, and people who like that type of fiction should, um, well, even just people who like good fiction should read those books. But And you can find out more by linking up to him at his website or Amazon or any place where books are sold. But it, the, the, the YouTube channel is fun. And that's where I found you originally when I was doing research on murders in the Mojave and uh, came across your work that way. But this new thing is pretty captivating because the 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 tradition of a Bigfoot, like you mentioned, has a strong Native American uh, association. I just didn't realize that the tradition could somehow be associated with that part of the desert. I think of it as being that if we're going to be looking at at tracks of a Yeti of some sort, that it's going to be in more wooded areas, not, you know, in the in the open. And if I'm Bigfoot and I'm hairy and I don't want to be in 125 degree heat. So, I mean, that's part of it, too, is I think I would never have expected this part of the story. Well, exactly. When I, I first moved here, one of the very first experiences I had was I hired a old prospector to take me around and show me, you know, what a prospector looks for, because I was kind of want, wanted to research gold uh, mining and all that. Yeah, why not? And I took him out, and uh, I, I've told this story before, so I won't go into the long version, but uh, we were taking a break, and he, he told me that um, – he used to be a man tracker in the Green Beret in Vietnam, and he did three tours. And, you know, that was fascinating because he was pointing out all these tracks to me. So I made a joke about Bigfoot because I had taken my boot off and stepped in the sand, and I got size 12 feet. So I, was, I went, hey, Bigfoot. He's like, oh, no, Bigfoot's a lot bigger than that. I'm like, oh, really? Uh, he goes, yeah, I've tracked Bigfoot. And I'm like, oh. No kidding. Now, I'm thinking, you know, the jungles of Laos or somewhere right. in Vietnam. He goes, no, up in Death Valley. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh man, you got to tell me this story. So he told me this really intriguing story about tracking Bigfoot through Death Valley. And uh, I'm like, wow, that's – it just was so genuine and unforced and, and unexpected that it kind of triggered, like, well, I'll, I'll start looking around at, at different stuff um, – other stories. And going back in the newspapers, I found stuff, you know, where ranchers and cowboys and cattlemen were talking about it in the desert. And then how the uh, Native Americans, the Serranos and the Paiutes and different ones would have a tradition of the hairy man or the giant uh, elder brother that lived out in the desert. 
Now, um, so it had long folklore along with what you would call conventional news reporting on it. Um, now, as far as like, well, what the hell is something that like that going to be eating, drinking, and, and right. sheltering in, in the right. desert? Now, here's the thing. When I say desert, a lot of people immediately think cactus and an endless landscape. Um, but there's mountains in the desert. And sure. a lot of we do see black bear. And black bear don't live in the desert. They're moving between the mountain ranges. So when they're out on the flats or crossing open land, you'll see them or see their track or, or encounter them. I mean, we still have people, you know, having their garbage raided even here at the in the desert. Um, so conceivably, a creature or whatever uh, could be living in the, the, the wilder upland, cooler areas and only crossing the desert floor when it's going someplace, right? So that could be one um, explanation for how it could even be possible. Now, bringing us to tonight and the, the pictures I sent you, um, what happened was, and... Um, wait, 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 before you do that. Yeah. Address the question, though, that you, you intoned, but you didn't get back to. What would they be eating? Because assuming that... Walking across the desert, you consume a lot of calories. Uh, these are, you know, if if we're talking about the the Bigfoot of folklore and the image that we have in our head, that's a big body to be moving around. Even if it moves only in the cool of the night, that's still going to burn up a lot. So what would they be eating um, out in the middle of the desert? Well, here's the thing. From a couple sources I've heard that they eat rodents and now people don't know that in the desert we've per square foot per square meter of the desert our rodent population is unreal you know we have ground squirrels uh all sorts of rats stuff like that and hmm. there's been reports of people have seen them eating you know these and when i say ground squirrel i mean not like a chipmunk we have those size but i mean a huge squirrel like right. size Right. And I had one report where a guy said he had seen one eat eight of those in one go. It had dug them up under rocks and then sat down and, and ate them, <laughs> everything but the tail. So uh, conceivably, um, it could find enough nourishment from a meal like that sure. uh, within an hour, two hour, three hours work for gathering it. Again, if it's moving from mountain range to mountain range, you know, up in the ranges, we've got deer and bighorn sheep and a lot bigger things that support a, a population of mountain lions. But are there reports of coming across various carci that people can't explain? Um, um, I, I myself have come across tons of, of uh, dead sh sheep up in the hills, but, you know, I would first assign it to a mountain lion right before i you know it, it, it's the old thing unless i saw bigfoot eating the mm -hmm. sheep i couldn't Having... tell you you know right if, if but finding the carcass is like something ate it so i would assume it was a mountain lion if if it was something other than that well that's a possibility too i guess uh, uh what about wolves do you get those or desert um, fox and what do you we get ha well we've got um coyotes we've got Koi oh, sure. dogs, which are like a mix oh. of dogs right. that's gone feral. Um, we have fox, and supposedly we've got gray wolves in a few spots in the Mojave. Okay. Um, certainly super rare these days. Back in the 1800s where there were a lot of animals and everyone seemed to shoot everything that moved. Right. Uh, we had all sorts of things. I mean, they even had jaguar and, and stuff like that that had come up from the Yucatan. Wow. Uh, been in the southern uh, areas of, like, you know, Texas, Arizona. Right, right. On over. So, so the, and then what about water? And again, and we'll get to the, the photos here in just a second, giving people time to get caught up by going to coast to coast am dot com, sure. clicking to desert strangeness slash open lines, which we'll get to in a couple hours. And then 
uh, and then going down, scrolling down, looking to related images, and you can see the photos that that Emil has collected just in the last what week? Two the weeks. photos that you took. Two weeks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, would there be? This is a question. I I really would they need to have a separate water supply if they were drinking? For example, if they were eating eight squirrels, if a Bigfoot were eating squirrels, would that provide enough liquid nourishment for him to not require a water supply? Now you're, you're asking me like I'm an expert on this. Well, I don't <laughs> know what the tradition I've is. Never, I've but, never I mean, seen, like, but, but I would imagine that that would not be nearly enough water. Then where would be a water source? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, the, the West was pushed through by going water hole to water hole. You know, uh, pe- yeah, you could fill up a barrel and put it in your wagon and go, but most of the trails, roads, and development of the the entire West was based on how far to the next water hole. So right. animals are no different. We have um, lots of uh, wild water holes and wilderness areas where, you know, you, you can't be in there after night because you'll scare the animals away from the water. Um, they get hmm. a huge range of, hmm. of, you know, animals out there drinking. So, um, yeah, it's hard to find. It is out there. And if you're out there, you're definitely going to need copious amounts of water. Well, that's what I, so I, I wanted to establish that because I think that's, with that as a background, then I think we can understand better the notion of traveling through the Mojave if the the hairy brother that lives out in the in the desert or you know yeti or bigfoot or however we want to look at this some sort of creature like that that would leave footprints like the ones that you photographed this week that we're not even we 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 can just check all the boxes that say yes survivable and that we wouldn't ha- no, let's not even go down the, the road then that oh this can't possibly be true because nothing could survive under those circumstances we've established they can and I love that. So tell us the story about how you came across these photos that you took. And these are actually, you took two different sets, right? Because you found one and then you found others? Yeah. Um, okay. Two different days. So ML Behrman spending time in the Mojave and suddenly, whoops, there's footprints yeah. that look really weird. Yeah. Well, it was one of those things where I was going to look for something else. A friend had told me that uh, a friend of his had said he had seen uh, orbs in this one canyon now oh, cool yeah now out here they're also called spook lights sometimes and in the mining days miners would see them and they would sometimes the superstitious ones would say well it's the ghost of a dead indian shaman or murder victim right. or they'd say it shows you where there is rare earth uh, deposits under the ground, you know, cool. uranium, and stuff like that. And they would actually look for it. And then some people think it's actually a, a piezoelectric static discharge caused by granite grinding, you know, due to earthquake <clears throat> or a fault line. Oh, interesting. So anyway, um, he had told me down by the eastern Mojave, uh, eastern central, um, by the Palin Mountains, that his friend had seen these up in, in, in this one ravine. So it was two, like a two-hour drive and then a six-mile hike. So I thought, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll go do it. Now, we're in the middle of a heat wave, so it's like 110, 115. Yeah. So I was like, oh, God, I'm, I'm going to wait and do it right before the sun goes down, and then right. I'll, I'll look at night. Right. Uh, so I get down there. I park my Jeep. I start down this old mining road. And um, like I say, it's like a six and a half mile round trip up by foot. And I, I'm maybe two miles into it. The sun's just about down. I come down this long straight, and I see a, a Jeep has gone through within the last week. So uh, obviously there was, there was some human activity. And as I'm walking along, uh, kind of daydreaming, thinking about how I was going to set up tonight, I had brought a thermal camera. Um, I saw a line of tracks coming out of the desert to my right, crossing the road, and then continuing on. Now, at a distance, I could see they were pretty uh, deep. And at first, I'm thinking, like, wow, I wonder if they got out of the Jeep and were, like, tromping around. But as I got up to it and right up to it, 
two things immediately. One, they weren't boot tracks. They looked like foot tracks with toes, and they were pretty deep, and they crossed the Jeep's tracks. So it had come across the road after the Jeep had passed. Uh, and I'm looking at it going like, am I looking at what I think I'm looking at? Uh, now, they weren't that big. They were, they were like a size uh, men's 10 or 11 maybe. And you can see one of the photos I sent, and I, I put my hand down just to show the how big it was. And the stride was not that big either. It, you know, it looked like an average person, but with weird feet. Now, uh, now back up for just a second. So if you had wanted to, you could have made that using just a normal human stride um, and maybe sandals on your feet you could have replicated the first photo you you found. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Reasonably close. Might have been hard, but yeah. Um, oh. Although it was deeper than than I would imprint. Oh, but, right. Of course. Um, yeah. Now, so I did a circle around them, you know, to try and cut the trail and see where it came and, and went to. And it had come up out of this other rocky ravine and traveled about 20 yards, crossed the road, and then continued on up this wash into a big ravine I could see about a quarter mile away. Um, so I was like, wow, you know, that's 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 really weird. <laughs> so I'm like, well, but I'm out trying to do something else, and I want to get to where I want, got to go before it gets too dark. So I took some pictures and moved on. And I got to the ravine I was shooting for. Spent most of the night there, didn't see a damn thing. Packed up. I'm coming out. It's about 3.30 in the morning. And I'm walking down this road with my headlamp on. And uh, I had seen coyotes. I had seen a small bobcat, a big owl, you know, and countless scorpions and stuff like that. I mean, what you see in a normal night in the Mojave. Right. Uh, I got up to the tracks. I'm like, I wonder if it came back or something. And... No, it was just the same tracks. I I didn't see it. I shined my light all around trying to pick up some eye shine or something. Didn't see it. So I went back to the Jeep, and I left, came home. A couple days later, you know, it just was bugging me like, like, uh, man, those were so fresh. They were so sharp. And and to see them there, you know, I got to go back and see if I can find them again and track them more or – find something else and i'm going to go earlier in the day so i've got daylight that i can actually try and track it and i went back it ended up being about five six days later i went back uh and this time i didn't park and go on foot i just drove in my jeep since it was the a jeep trail uh and i have the top off so i can hang out and go real slow and look right and there'd been enough wind and stuff that uh, the old one, the first ones I had found had been pretty much obliterated. They were, you know, I I couldn't really get much more out of them. And it looked like a Jeep had gone by within the last day or two also. Uh, So it had destroyed whatever tracks were on the road. Right. So I'm driving, and I get just maybe a quarter mile away and I look down on the bank right next to me, and there is like a mama track. I'm like, whoa, am I looking at what I think I'm looking at? So I stop, jump out, go over, and that's the the second set of tracks that you'll see in the photos. In the road. And, yeah. Well, no, the, the one that has the water bottle next to it. That's oh, right. The one, that's the one up on the bank. Okay. Okay. That water bottle's a, a liter and a half bottle. It's 12 inches long. Okay. And that makes that track about 16 inches. And you wow. can see it looks like toes and everything. And I went, wow, you know, that's a, that is a big foot. <laughs> that's a big track. Right. And then I looked in the road. It stepped off the bank and walked up the middle of the road. And what struck me immediately, and you'll see in, in the photo, is the length of the stride yeah. between these tracks. And I measured it. It was almost four and a half feet between, you know, from toe to heel. Right. And, and I actually tried to, to match it to the side, and I had to jump, really jump to make it. And uh, 
it had gone up the road a bit and then gone off the trail and then headed over towards the area where I'd found the first tracks before it petered out in some gravel bank that uh, it was following. Because it's easier to walk on hard gravel in the, in the desert than sand. Um, now, here's something. When you said about water, what's interesting is both set of tracks were going towards that canyon that was off to the side of the one I had originally gone to. And I'm like, I wonder right. what's up that canyon. If they're going up there, I wonder if there's water up there. Huh. And uh, I'll get back to the tracks in a sec. But I came home and I went on Google Earth, the satellite, which I always do. I found the spot. And I started following that can that ravine. Right. I saw there was like some really green brush up at the top of it in the side area where there must be water. So I was actually, when I talked to you this morning, I was, I was getting packed to go out again because I, I went and grabbed a trail camera because I want to hike up into that ravine to that water hole and set up a camera and see if I can see anything coming Yeah, up. like that three water. of them <laughs> from every yeah. angle. <laughs> uh, that water. Um, now, back to the pictures. Uh, now, I showed those uh, to my girlfriend. Yeah. who, uh, God bless her, is, you know, a skeptic on most stuff, except the stuff she believes in. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, you don't really think there's something that big out there. And I'm, I'm like, okay, let, let's approach it a little bit critical thinking. Right. Now, I'm 6'2", 250 pounds, with a size 13 boot. Now, that thing's boot, that thing's foot, was a lot bigger than my foot. It impressed a lot deeper than I do at 250 pounds. So give him 100 pounds. He probably weighs 350. Now that stride is easily uh, a third or more bigger than the stride I can do. If you were trying, even. If I was trying. So so give him a foot on height, you know, longer legs. So now you've got some guy out there that's, seven foot tall, 350 pounds, walking barefoot in that sand and choya cactus and, you know, mm. ro- sharp rocks and everything else. Right. Scorpions. Yeah. Like, I, if that's a human, I don't want to meet that guy either. Right. right. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. You certainly don't want to meet him there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, okay, hon, uh, let's assume it, it is totally human. It's like, who is that human? Right. You know, what asylum did he get out of and... You know, uh, right. what is well, he doing out there? And look at, and again, for people who go to coasttocoastam.com on tonight's uh, Desert Strangeness link, and we're about an hour away from open lines, but we're going to get to your calls about this coming up in a few minutes. And go take a look at these photographs, because I think there are people who have either, A, seen plenty of tracks themselves, who have phoned in or written in over the years on coast, or... People who have even done even more research and been part of expeditions and studied this sort of thing. We reached out to Jeff Meldrum at Idaho State. We couldn't find him. We think maybe he's out looking for Bigfoot this week, too. For all we know, he's on one of his expeditions uh, as well, maybe shooting something for TV. Or maybe it's just, you know, a crazy time at the university for him like it is for everybody else. But whatever it is, we I mean, there's there's insight in these photos We just may not have all of it, but when you say that the way that Native Americans have told the story or the old timers, you know, the old prospectors have told the stories to you, this sounds very consistent with this idea of a hairy brother in the desert. Yeah, um, some of the tribes uh, view it as an an animal just like a a deer or a bear or, or something else. It's just part of the natural universe that happens to live side by side with them, and if they don't bother it, it doesn't bother them. That are bipedal, though, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that are not like a deer walking around on hind feet, but no, this and is... and it's funny, because one of the, the creation stories, uh, and I don't want to name the tribe because I'll massacre their name, but um, right. supposedly the uh, elemental animals were meeting with the Great Spirit when he was going to create man, and each one of them contributed something like the the fish said he should be able to swim the hawk said he should have good eyesight like me uh the coyote said he should run on all fours like i do but hairy man 
said, no, he should walk upright like I do on two legs. And that's how man came to be bipedal in, in this one Native American creation right. story, which right. I thought was fascinating. I loved that. Um, the other because that, loved that, would, that, would put it, that would put him in kind of a, I mean, a missing link almost uh, position between what we would, you know, for people who are uh, Darwinists who would say, well, in the theory of evolution, at one point we didn't walk on on our hind legs. We grew to do that, and our bodies morphed into the bodies that we have today. But in this sense, he was kind of that link between – because he's – theoretically, hairy man in the desert is still, quote-unquote, uninvolved unevolved he's not like he's not in a tribe he's not in a he's still the original form that god would have created in that story uh, yeah in that story and and some tribes believe that he, he's a being between two worlds you know oh, half right spirit, half right and he only appears to impart a message or to confuse you i've heard with, this many times yeah yeah that he leaves just so you can ponder the world and not think you're conceited enough to know everything Right. Now, in the 1800s, you read the newspaper accounts, and if you go to my YouTube thing, you'll see uh, the Cement Monster, the Capé, Curiosity, uh, the Rabbit Snatcher, different stories that are based on the old newspaper accounts that, that I show, the actual article. They were more of like, hey, it leaves feet, it walks like a man, it's hairy, it must be some prehistoric man, or their favorite term, which I love, is the what is it. You know, it's like... Right. <laughs> They didn't, you know, somewhere like it must be an orangutan that escaped from a circus on the right, 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 right. You know, uh, stuff like that. And uh, so they treated it as a lot more of of like what we see. It's like, wow, there's tracks and someone saw something hairy and, you know, the pigs are missing or the. the, Right. You know. On Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Punnett. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.